Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sahara Lake. I'm the Programs Manager at the Tory Burch Foundation, and welcome to our Small Business Webinar Series. Um, if you haven't yet, please take the opportunity to introduce yourself in the chat. We love knowing where our audience is from. Um, and now I would like to take the opportunity to introduce today's speaker. So Malika Jacobs is the founder of Myriad and also a member of our community as a 2021 Tory Burch Foundation Fellow. Um, her entrepreneurial journey began with Kingmakers, serving both the public and corporate clients for six years with two Midwest brick and mortar board game parlors. So she's now a founder of Myriad, a B2B uh, B2B marketplace featuring emerging and specialized HR tech, supporting a holistic employee experience. And Malika continues her thoughtful and joyful approach to building intentional and beloved team cultures. And so we're really excited to have Malika here with us today to talk about team building tactics and policies. So Malika will present to us and after her presentation, we will have plenty of time for Q&A. So please be sure to ask questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, please keep the chat function more for reactions and chatting amongst yourselves um, and use the Q&A so we can pull out questions, making sure we're getting to as many questions as possible. Um, today's session will be recorded and we will be able to share the slides following today's session. So please watch your inboxes for the reply link later this afternoon. And with that, Malika, I'm going to turn it over to you to get started. Awesome, Sahara. Thank you so much for the intro. I'm going to share. Y'all bear with me because this will probably be the most challenging part of this for me is the technical. <laughs> but it's great to see so many of you today. And I'm so grateful for the Tory Burch Foundation always for all the support they've shown over the past few years to both me, but also a whole host of female founders that I consider really dear friends um, today. So excited to be here with you all. Um, let me see if I can get this started. Awesome. So let's see. So I'd love to start by sharing a bit of personal history with you all and how I got interested in how groups of people work together. I track my interest in teams back to three sort of foundational things. So one is that I moved around a lot as a kid. Um, two is that I've often felt like an outsider in the spaces that I've been in. And three is that I've had a lot of work experience across very different work environments. So starting from the beginning, even before all the moving started, <laughs> in our longest stretch of staying put, I spent my early childhood on the campus of Michigan State University while my parents were there. And so that's a super transient community. Folks would come in from around the world and around the country, then they'd leave. In a couple in a couple of years. So that's how I sort of got to know how to make friends. And in those early years, just having a lot of new kids to get to know all the time. Then the moving started. So I started seventh grade in a different state. And then in the middle of that, my parents decided to move back to our home country of Sri Lanka, which was wild and a wonderful experience all at once. And then back to the US and then to a different state the next year. So every time I got comfortable somewhere or with a group of people, there was a change and a new experience to wrap my head around. Change has always been constant for me. And most of that change has been a result of the people in front of me being new. So secondly, in most of the spaces I've existed, I have felt like an outsider because of my language in the early days, skin color, gender, country of origin, lack of religious identity, economic status, and even the caliber of my previous education all have contributed to me having this sense of being an outsider. And so this has made me pretty adaptable and I've learned how to play up or down certain parts of myself. I've learned how to be a good listener without necessarily co-signing onto what I'm hearing. And probably most of all, it's made me empathetic to others. I can see group dynamics with a bit more curiosity and detachment than someone who may feel at home in the space. And I've been able to see patterns of behavior from group to group, no matter how different those groups may seem to someone on the outside. Lastly, I've worked in a lot of different work environments. So the similarities and pattern recognition started to apply, um, pattern recognition started to apply to the professional spaces I was finding myself in as well. 
I took my first job at 16 as a cashier, and I've worked in restaurants all over the country, greenhouses, knocked on doors for the census, and then after college, the nonprofit sector in Washington, D.C. I was finding that whether it was pizza or a new charter school, I began to observe that a leader's ability to get people excited and execute was all that mattered. So I decided to get an MBA because I was interested in how some organizations were able to create structures that did this really, really well, while others seemed to miss the mark completely. So when I reflect back, these are the three things that influence the work I do today, and really what has led me to the guiding truth in my professional journey, which is that teams are what drives success in any environment. Share that with you. Um, I've explored this belief across a lot of different industries, including academically and then in my own companies, which I'll share about. And it's what motivates me to pursue entrepreneurship. I'm just fascinated by how teams make or break the execution of new business ideas. I was listening to a conversation that the founder of Graham and Walker, which is a venture capital fund um, supporting diverse founders. Some of you may be familiar with them. Their founder was speaking in conversation last week, and she mentioned something that is often said about entrepreneurs and, and startups, that ideas are a dime a dozen. But it really, true, that really is very true, and execution and your team is what is the power that drives whether you're successful or not. So, okay, bear with me here. So I wanted to share a bit about um, the companies I founded just for some further grounding. So we're all have, sharing the same context. Um, there's three of them. So Kingmakers, as Sahara mentioned, was a, a board game parlor or board game bar. We called them parlors. Uh, the second was Kingmakers, which is a virtual team bonding company. And then lastly, uh, Myriad, which is the company that I'm working current on, on currently, which is a tech startup. So I opened Kingmakers in 2014, and it operated for six years until 2020 in two Midwest locations. So Columbus, Ohio, where I am currently, and our neighboring uh, state, Indianapolis, Indiana. And we serve the public in the evenings and business clients for team bondings during the day. We employed about five full-time people and 15 part-time team members. The crux of Kingmakers was our team of what we call board game sommeliers, similar to a wine sommelier. They provided the usual bar service, but their true talent was recommending and teaching board games to any group of people who came in. So novice, experienced, young, old, first dates, board in-laws, you name it, we served all of them. So because they were the experience, who we hired, trained, and inspired was really all there was to Kingmakers. In 2020, we pivoted the team bonding business of Kingmakers to virtual, becoming a strictly B2B business model. So we only serve corporate clients through one of the most tumultuous periods of employee engagement from 2020 to 2022 this year. That model employed a handful of full-time folks and a contracted team of facilitators. So similar to the previous model, our differentiator was the people. Our facilitators made board game play over Zoom an incredibly beloved experience that people booked over and over again. Being in such close conversation with so many people managers and HR leaders over the past few years allowed us to see a much bigger challenge. And Myriad, the current company, was born out of taking learnings from employee engagement and applying them to holistic to the holistic employee journey. So Myriad is a B2B marketplace, and I work alongside two people who I hired in early 2020 and who have gone through these two pivots with me. Okay, so now that we're caught up on today, let's take a moment to pause. I'm gonna um, ask you, what is one thing that's made you smile today? I know I can't see you all, but I'd love to know the answer to this question. And while you're dropping them in the chat, I'm gonna engage in the chat here in a bit and take a look. Um, this is also a nod to how I think about teams. First of all, we've been in the business of play for years. So we try to infuse that ethos into how we work on a daily basis um, as well. So please drop your answers in the chat, check them here in a second. 
And also, I think most importantly, if you're not having fun with your team and people and enjoying the ride, what's the point, right? So I see some answers coming in. Thank you. As entrepreneurs, we know that there are many other potentially less roller coastery ways to have a profession. So it's really about finding the moments that are enjoyable, even during the constant up and down. Awesome. I see so many answers coming in. Give me a sec here. I'll try to read off a few. Um, <laughs> oh, getting a thank you text from my college daughter. That is no um, small feat and definitely worth a smile. Um, kiddos that are dressed up as reindeer. I'm going to share something very similar to that that made me smile today. Um, guilty pleasure watching TV. My green smoothie. Love it. Love all these. Having two meetings canceled. Always a good day. <laughs> Looking out the door and breathing in fresh air, small pleasures, having a strong body. I get that one. I love all these. Um, my great nephew stopping by to say hi. Um, a rowing class, prioritizing demands. That's awesome. And working lunch at a favorite restaurant. <laughs> this webinar. Thank you. <laughs> Um, seeing Santa riding a bike this morning. Awesome. So I'm going to share one too, which is very similar. So this made me smile today. Uh, my four-year-old daughter must've just left this on the office table, but she brought this from school last, um, last night. And the thing that cracked me up about it is they made this craft last year. <laughs> so I was like, oh, here's the Santa face again. But this was, um, she held it up last year and took a picture and had her tongue sticking out in a very silly, playful way. And it's a picture that I've looked at a lot over the past year. So when she walked out of, you know, the car with this, um, again, this year, I had to chuckle and <laughs> it just kind of made me laugh and smile. So, um, if anybody else wants to share seeing Santa riding a bike this morning, you're talking about that one. Great. The opportunity to just wake up. Um, awesome. I love this. Great playing a slow jazz instrumental music piece after a long day in the office while having a glass of wine. Great. We'll all look forward to that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Meeting new people. Well, thank you all for sharing. Um, this is awesome. Um, it definitely made me smile and pause in the, in this webinar. So thank you so much. Um, awesome. So now that we're all smiling, we can move on to the topic at hand. Awesome. I'm going to go back to the slides here. And we are here to talk about trust and role modeling in teams. So just again, as some further grounding for today's webinar, I'm going to really focus on how trust and role modeling have been at the heart of how I've thought about all of the teams I've built. And so I'll offer examples um, across the ventures that I've had. And I do want to make clear that the principles I'm talking about, the tactics, the policies, whatever you want to call them, are the result of the background um, that I've had. And so they're based on experiences with um, small business, early stage startups, so not so much applicable to the corporate environment. And these are no cost tactics, right? So the second one is that I, th I think it's just a, an approach and a practice and a mindset versus something you can really purchase or, um, you know, that's what we're talking about today. And then lastly, I'm mostly referring to teams that are less than 20. So I do think as companies scale, you can maintain these tactics on an approach on individual teams led by managers, but it's not real. It's harder. It gets harder and harder to apply to the company as a whole um, without sort of tweaking some of the structures that we're talking about today. So uh, let's get started. All right. So I'm hoping to share three with you. Um, the first is to start from a place of trust. Um, the standard interview process that most of our most of us are familiar with really sets a tone of mistrust from the beginning. So it plays into established power dynamics. Usually the employer is trying to suss out bad fit by making an employee jump through a number of tests, right? So a different option is to enter hiring with a mindset of finding mutual best fit for that period of time in your company. And I think that there's three things um, that support intentional design as you're interviewing and onboarding. The first is to provide a clear job description. The second is to know your culture. And lastly, to embrace the unique opportunity of an entrepreneurial and early stage environment. So starting back from the top, 
I recommend devoting time up front to write a clear job description to the best of your ability. So try to answer what are the actual qualities and skills that you are looking for. This is just as much about soft skills as it, as, as it is about what tactically needs to be accomplished in the role. The soft skills part of this may even be more important. So it's an opportunity to truly expectation set from the beginning. Secondly, you have to understand and then be honest about your current culture, even and especially the parts that aren't ideal or that you are aspiring to change because you are trying to attract the right fit hires and setting folks up for success in the current environment, right? So it's not helpful to be, um, to try to hide something or to cover something up or to talk about a future state. It's really important to know what your current honest state is as a company culture. For example, if you aren't investing in project management software or processes, for example, right, then an employee will have to be self-motivated to manage their own to-do list. So this isn't a judgment call on your culture itself, but it gives you and potential candidates a clear understanding of the work environment and the work style that's expected. So lastly, I really encourage all of you here to embrace the unique opportunity of not being a corporate behemoth, right? The whole point of us doing this is that we're not that. Yes, it's a lot of work to build a culture your way instead of mirroring the status quo. I think a lot of times when we're confused about what we do, we look to examples that are not really relevant or um, applicable to us as small business and startup founders but that can be really attractive for your talent. So often in the early days, you don't have anything that really is going to attract talent to your company as opposed to going to one of those companies, except the culture that you're building. So you can take bigger risks and experiment in ways that established companies just sometimes can't. So there are times when I've taken my advice well and times that I haven't. So I wanna share um, one example of when I think we did these things really well and it paid off tremendously. And another example of when we didn't. Um, so back to March of 2020, you all remember that time, right? <laughs> um, I, I hired two new people um, in early 2020 and they started in March of 2020, which was wild. Um, and I'm going to talk about one person I hired who I worked really hard to hire. It was a constant back and forth with her um, about her coming on. And I knew that I really wanted to hire her as a person because I knew that she had so much to contribute. I saw her as someone who was hugely curious, who was open to change. Um, and I knew that we were in a moment where we were thinking of a strategic shift in the business model. I didn't realize how big that shift was going to have to be over the next like week, two weeks. But I did, I was planning for a slight strategic shift and change in direction. And I thought she would really own that. Um, and I could, I could tell from the way that she carried herself and talked about her strengths and what she wanted to create that she would really take ownership of that. So she was coming in with a lot of fresh ideas and that's what I wanted. Um, I, did not understand, obviously, as many of us didn't, what was about to happen over the next couple of weeks. And so the gravity of change, and we were in a service sector business, we were public facing, we were you know, shut down by government mandate. So everything was on the table to decide what, how to move forward. Um, this individual, because we had had all these conversations about it during their interview process about what they wanted to do at this point in their professional career, career, I already had a lot of trust in how she carried herself as a person and trust in her ideas and her motivations um, and really her support of the business, even in that short couple weeks. And so over the next couple months, she was a huge advocate for abandoning the current business model. She would coach me and sort of tell me that she thought that the next couple of years, it, that it was going, first of all, that it was going to be a couple of years or longer, um, and that it was going to bring about fundamental shifts in business. And I, I, I didn't know, I, I mean, I didn't know, right. And I sort of went out on a limb to trust her she brought the rest of the team on board. She helped me bring the rest of the team on board. Um, 
And when I trusted her, it saved us from what would have been a slow and dying death. We were able to pivot pretty quickly into the virtual team bonding. We moved on. We acknowledged the grief and, and of the public and the team that had supported us for the past six years in our previous business model. So I think we handled it with a lot of care, which is her personality and her style. But she really coached me to let it go and to move on in a pretty dramatic and big way. And so there was a lot of trust there from the beginning. I look back on that and I'm I'm just amazed that we were able to form that trust really quickly, but I think it stemmed from a lot of intentionality around the conversations about what I wanted in that hire at that time. On the flip side, um, I also made a hire of a person who I'd worked with for a long time. They were actually my account rep as they were at a previous company and we bought into their service. And I adored him. I just thought he was the best um, account rep I'd ever had at one of these companies. So I encouraged him to join our team. And I probably took a lot, a little bit less care and was more lackadaisical and how I thought about the job description and what we wanted, you know, about how he worked and how we were working at the time, because I just assumed that he was going to be a great fit because he was a great person. And I really appreciated his, the care that he showed me as a client. Um, it turns out that that really wasn't a great fit. So great person, great skills, but not for the moment in time that we, we were in and the stage of growth that we were in. When I knew him, he worked at a company with an established company culture and he was executing. We needed somebody to come in and to take ownership of their tasks and really self-delegate, self-motivate, self-prioritize. And that wasn't the forte of this individual. And I didn't have the capacity at that time to coach and mentor that. And so it just really wasn't a great fit. And I did what most people do. And I know that it's happening. And then I bury it and don't acknowledge it and sort of let it go on for a bit until it reaches a boiling point and a tipping point. So unfortunately, I did have to let that person go. Um, I think I did it with as much care as we could. And we remain friends to this day. However, it just could have avoided a really bad um, or a really not productive year for him and for our company. If I had better understood his skill sets matching up with the moment of time in our company culture and our work style and work environment at the time that I was hiring him. So just a couple examples there of this, of this um, tactic. Okay, let's see. I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, the second point is about um, inviting full participation. Let's see if I can get to this. Give me a second. Sorry. Um, and once you've hired the best fit people, you should really set up a culture where you can invite them to participate fully. So this is really the day-to-day -day work of your culture and work environment, um, and how you as a leader impact that culture. So a few things to think about here when designing and putting this into practice. So investing and trusting and expertise beyond your own. Number two I have here is designating time for brain sailing, and I'll talk about what that means, and then flattening hierarchy and elevating interaction. So starting with the top one, this is thinking of your employees as one of, as one of if not, the biggest investments you are going to make. So you shouldn't be hiring for things that you can do or that you want to do or that you should do, right? So you should be hiring to fill in the gaps in your skill set or knowledge or time. And then after you set clear expectations, you should play a facilitator role from that point forward. A second tactic that really helps here is setting aside time for brain sailing. So we have moments on our, on our calendar where we're just thinking aloud and all possibilities and all options are on the table. So brain sailing is brainstorming, but with a little bit of whimsy, right? So does it mean anything different? No, but it does make us smile and kind of chuckle every time we say it. So that's why we call it that. So it is carving out time to innovate and welcome all ideas without judgment. And that allows true outside of the box thinking that generates the next brilliant idea that you may need and you maybe didn't even know that you needed, right? So this isn't about moments of execution so much as strategic thinking and sort of um, fostering that climate where those ideas emerge. And lastly, lastly, flattening hierarchy and elevating Interaction. This is about constantly questioning and assessing where hierarchy serves you and your company and where it can be removed. 
So usually when you flatten hierarchy, it's replaced with collaboration, participation, and interaction across the company and the team. I'll give an example of this um, in practice and how I think we created a really high performing culture without micromanaging. So when I opened my first board game parlor, I didn't know a thing about board games. I knew about hospitality and service, but not the thing that I wanted to be the benchmark of our unique experience. So I hired passionate board gamers and really even more so folks who were interested in learning new games and then teaching them to others. So our general manager and I would have this constant um, conversation about the balance of service training versus board game training. And ultimately we landed on, we can teach someone to serve a beer easier than we can teach them to be excited about connecting people through gameplay or play, right? So we basically hired a bunch of super compassionate, curious, fun-loving folks who knew board games. And then we put in a tip share model. And this is where that sort of removal of hierarchy comes in. So every shift tips are pooled and then split up based on the hours that are worked. So this encourages everyone on a floor and a team to help each other and then also help each guest without thinking about what's in it for them. So we put in that structure, that intentional design to create this, to foster this sort of um, culture that we were trying to build. So this works so well that when we opened our second location, I never actually worked on the floor in Indianapolis. First of all, I was out of state and I was having my second child. So that was um, part of it. But also I had a team that I trusted from our first location who could emulate the culture and build that culture in our second location. And they did. So I think what I found is that when you create this type of culture of ownership of the work like this, employees actually hold themselves and each other to even a higher standard than you ever could. So instead of this top-down management, it just becomes a collaborative space for this, where the coaching and the um, accountability is happening in a more flat way. So one of the coolest things we did in our pivot to virtual team bonding was to try to create this culture of full participation in every team bonding. So I want to share, I thought I might share a little um, clip of that. I, I, oh, I hire. Um, so I want to show um, a clip here, but I want you to know that there's a lot of um, thought and intentionality behind the scenes here in event and facilitation design to create these outcomes that you're going to see during this clip, right? So um, this is about a four minute video and it's a highlight reel of a series of team bondings that we did with one of our clients. So you can kind of observe and be on the lookout for how we facilitate how we invite playfulness, personal sharing, gratitude, and a sense of belonging through this intentional design about asking everyone to participate fully. So I'll go ahead and play this now. Give me one sec here, please. I want to start from the beginning. Okay. I hire really good people. <laughs> baby back, baby back. <laughs> Dog show. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lake is on fire. Bigger than a baby, but smaller than a house. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like called Mozart Grilla or something. Like it's not Mozart cheese. What's it? Uh, mozzarella. Mozzarella. It's called mozzarella. What's uh, like the, Grin the Grinch's finger? Like. <laughs> Uh, I think it's in the Bible. Time to live, a time to die, a time to butter, a time to fly. I, I just heard the song, the song yesterday. I just heard it. That is the best quote ever. I love it. You are going to act this out. Amanda is awaited everyone. I need a banana. Eating a banana. A monkey. A monkey eating a banana in space. Yes. <laughs> The mountains are on fire. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I should quit my day job, right? No. No, we need you. You have to stay. <laughs> it was interesting because a lot of people assumed I was like thinking legal stuff and policies and procedures, but I was thinking of my thousandth day anniversary of my significant other. So. Oh. 
Well, she thinks she's a lap dog. Come on. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> I would probably merge my two kiddos' names together. So that would be the boat. Be King Cal or Kingston and Callie. I love it. I put a lot of pressure on you, but you always come through. You always Oh, come. that was really nice. Oh, I would have just said she helps us keep it all together and pulls us all. I love this group. It's not work if you love it, Susan Jim. You remind me of that, okay? But you know what? Being being with these kids, is, if you don't know how they're doing, that is for me. In fact, I don't know if you can see this, but my new baby is coming tomorrow. Aww. The autistic, and he is, as you can see, that smile is awesome. That's awesome, Veronica. I know how important you are. I don't think any parent or any person should have to make that hard decision based on whether they have enough money in the shoe or not. I think it should be, you always get to go to the doctor and get taken I really appreciated um, how everyone showed up and every single person on this on this call has like four things that they're supposed to be doing right now. Made it a priority to be here. I did not realize how much I think we all needed just relax and have fun and act silly and um, this is me acting it out. <laughs> Hello! Hello. Hi, yes. <laughs> Everyone's having a turnover. It's called the Great Migration and the Great Resignation. Everyone's leaving and we haven't had any turnover. I think it's real good. Everyone brings something really important to this team. It's amazing. It's just, it's like, I don't know how it happened, but I, I hire really good people. <laughs> Best team in Indiana. Awesome. All right. Thank you all for watching that. Give me a second to get out of that. <laughs> Told you the technical aspect of this would be the most challenging for me. Awesome. So this is actually a really nice segue into the last point that I want to talk about, which is um, prioritizing personal and professional balance. Um, you saw moments of professional and personal personal kind of sharing throughout that clip. So it's a really nice way to move into this. And this is maybe admittedly like the most challenging part of maybe what teams are managing today. Um, it's a really hard balance to strike. Um, and I thought it'd be fitting to sort of end here and wrap up here. Cause I think it's an area that's in such flux right now. And it's a very salient topic that's resonating in any work environment right now at the macro level and sort of the world of work. Um, and on a personal level, it's an area that I'm always striving to grow in as a leader. I've, you know, I've, there have been moments that I feel like I've done it well and moments that I haven't put in structure for this very well. So it's a, it's a, just a constant learning area for me. Um, so three things that I think can help and have been helpful to us when we've done this better, um, that help structure an environment where there is balance between, um, personal and professional is one to name the time two, to honor needs, and then three, and this is probably one of the things that I just think is so critical, is to motivate versus make, uh, create a culture of urgency. So I'll talk about all these three. So starting with naming the time, um, <clears throat> when and how much you label um, personal time versus professional time in your team is, you know, can be dictated, determined by the level of sharing in your culture and your team culture. So for example, I block my calendar off for yoga and I label it as yoga. Um, this has allowed my colleagues to, you know, it's made them comfortable to name their therapy appointments as therapy and it's on our calendars. And I certainly, you know, don't expect all personal time to be named, but again, in that role modeling, um, putting it on my calendar and sharing it, you know, is a way to demonstrate that I'm comfortable with that, that I prioritize that, and that I allow my team to prioritize that. In general, even if it's not named as, you know, the time, the personal time that it is, any time that we are stepping away from a professional sort of time expect expectation where we'd be um, expected to show up 
professionally, we do um, uh, just make sure that we're letting our colleagues know that we're taking personal time away, putting it on our calendars, things like that, so that the work can continue around us and everyone can be in the know about sort of the expectation of our time and being present in that way. So especially in remote work environments or, you know, hybrid work environments, I think um, naming time and putting it out there in a, in a Slack message or a calendar can be really helpful for that balance. And then once something is named, honoring and accounting for that time, right? It's important to make sure that it's not scheduled over. So I do everything in my power to not schedule over, over personal time and to model that behavior. So I don't budge on my Tuesday morning yoga, though every week I consider it, right? I think about it and I think about all the things I could be doing instead of doing that. But at the end of the day, I know that making that time away from myself means that I'm more productive when I am at work. So likewise, I don't ask my colleagues to reschedule around their therapy appointments, right? That time is our own. We've named it We've and we're honoring it. So that's just how we, an example of how we show that, or I, we demonstrate that. And the last one is to motivate your team versus create a culture of urgency. So motivation means discovering what drives individuals on your team. Urgency creates unnecessary stress and burnout. Urgency often gets in the way of the boundary between professional and personal time. So I have a saying on my team, and it, no, it's not as relevant anymore, but I said it a lot in the beginning, so I continue to say it, right? It's board games, not brain surgery. Nothing we are doing at work is life or death. And so even though we're not in the business of board games anymore, it's still true, right? Um, nothing is so important that we're doing at work that it has to overcome someone's personal well-being or the way that they pr prioritize their personal time or what matters to them um, in their personal lives. And so those are just some examples of how um, we think about this. And there were a couple other things I was going to bring up, but in the interest of time, I'll just I'll just share them as links or have somebody drop them in if that's okay um, from the Tory Birch team side. Um, because I want to leave time to for questions and answer or for a Q&A, but um, I'll share a couple um, or there's be a couple links in the chat on some thought pieces that our team has written around this. So the first is about how we renamed um, our fun chat in Slack to not always fun chat, um, especially because it was established in 2020 in the midst of all that was going on globally and nationally at the time. So there's a link to a little piece that we wrote about that decision and how that um, Slack channel lives on today as not always fun chat. And the second is a blog titled um, Why Kingmakers is Not a Family, which was written um, after a lot of internal conversations around the topic. So I know that's something that um, is casually said, is said in a lot of different contexts, and there's a lot of debate around this right now, but if you'd like to see our take on it or kind of check that out for yourself, that um, blog is linked as well. So this truly is an evolving conversation about bringing your authentic self to work and defining what it means to be professional. Um, an HR mentor of ours recently put it this way, right? So employers say they want employees to show up fully. But really what that means is only when it's positive, right? Only when it's good and fun. That's when we want you to show up fully. And I think just acknowledging sort of how you deal with the parts of people that aren't always the most positive, that can be challenging, that can disrupt work, that can um, cause you to pause, I think is, is equally important. And so striking the right balance of what's appropriate for you and your company is a constant learning moment, you know, opportunity. And it's something that we're constantly working on as well, even on our small team where we do have a lot of trust, but these moments come up for us as well. Um, let's see. So to wrap up, I'm going to share a few service providers that um, hopefully might support you in your attempt to build a healthy team. So let me pull that slide up real quick. Um, uh, first, we have Storybolt. Oh, so first of all, all these uh, these three companies are are founded by female founders, right? So that's really awesome. And Storybolt um, is the first one here, and they are a platform to deliver inclusion training through high uh, high quality documentary style approach. They're um, they're linked. Sesh is the middle one. 
It's a platform of licensed uh, therapists that offers group therapy for teams, all virtual. Um, it's a mental wellness platform that may be convenient for your team. Um, the last one here is virtual with us. Um, and you can show recognition, team recognition and appreciation through their events, all virtual as well. Um, so added bonus, she's a current uh, Tori Birch fellow and my mentee. So Alex and her team are super focused on spotlighting diverse vendors and their services. So also a really unique approach to team events. And that's it. I'll wrap up there um, and invite um, any questions. Thank you for listening. I hope it was helpful and resonated. And um, I hope each of you is able to develop a truly supported team that also supports you. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Sahara. <laughs> yeah, of course. Look, if you want to take down your screen yeah. share or if the team can do it for you so they can love see, your, see our faces as we chat yeah. here. Um, <laughs> so people, as, as I'm going to ask some questions that people sent in advance. And as we chat, feel free to keep the questions coming in the Q&A box and the team and I will do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, but Malika, I want to start with this one. Um, can you talk more about tips and approach on motivating versus push pushing for a sense of urgency? I would also love to hear because I love that. <laughs> I think that's so important. Yeah, it is. It's really, um, it's so interesting for me. It's like, I know it when I see it and it's hard, it's really hard to describe. So even in trying to put this together, I was trying to think about what that is. Right. And what that looks like, looks like mechanics wise on a team. Mm -hmm. Um, I do. It's interesting. I had a meeting with someone scheduled yesterday. She wrote me and said, I, uh, I'm so sorry. I have an urgent thing that has come up and it's just, it's just, it's such a natural response for people. Right. And I see it. My husband works for a big corporation here um, in Columbus and it's fire after fire after fire. That's how the team um, operates. That's how they, that's honestly how they are motivated. It's sort of what is the next fire to put out. Right. Um, and I think that ultimately, so I put it in the context of the personal professional balance, because that is what starts to then impact your personal well-being, right? When there right. is, when you're sort of being told that something is urgent, then your natural um, desire as a helpful human being that is wanting to contribute and to contribute well to a work environment is to then give more of yourself so that you can help to slow down that urgency. So, I mean, of course there are things that truly come up in any team, you know, any work environment that have to be addressed in the moment, but a culture of urgency then starts to erode at people's ability to separate out um, their time to eat, lunch, right? To take a quick walk, to um, laugh at something that has nothing to do with work. Like it just starts to, they stay at work later. They start to come in earlier. They start to cut it. So then at the end of the day, it's just, if you take a look and step back at creating that sense of urgency without, I think a, a better approach is to sort of long-term planning, to stick to goals, to, you know, to, to be clear if you are switching from a goal that you've set for yourself or a deadline or a task is to sort of say why, and then to, you know, to explain that and then to move on to the next thing. But, um, I mean, I think theoretically, we all know this, that over time that erodes a company culture and, and right. an output, but it is the way we, a lot of companies tend to default over time. And so it's just being really diligent and intentional about asking yourself what kind of culture you're creating for your people. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, another question, what question should I ask during an interview to determine whether someone is a good culture fit for my existing team? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so one thing you can do is, so if you have an existing team, you can ask your existing team. <laughs> Right. So yeah. this will be a great um, exercise and sort of how they think about their own work styles, because a lot of it does come to your company culture sort of defaults to the folks that are there, right? Like, how do they prefer to work? Um, so I find, I think a lot of us know that in startup and sort of entrepreneurial environments, a lot of people are doing a lot of different things. And so the ability to prioritize and to um, decide for yourself what's important and what's not important to um, be able to speak up and say, hey, I think that's the wrong direction because a lot of it in companies like ours, we're making it up as we go along, right? So having someone that's able to say, like, I, I think we're going in the wrong direction 
um, and to maybe work asynchronously is the thing that's happening right now. And it's kind of being um, addressed in a way, I mean, it's been happening forever, but it's just being addressed in a different way now that remote work environments are more prominent, but being able to understand when are those moments where I'm working with a team and what are the moments that I'm working by myself and sort of producing and, and creating content or outputs that are self-motivated and self-guided. Um, but if you have an existing team, a really cool exercise might be to ask how they think about their work styles. And then you're looking for those types of work styles that match the existing team. If you're trying to create a continuous, you know, culture that you have, um, sometimes shaking it up and bringing in someone new can be really helpful, but it usually is not great if you have a really established work culture and you're trying to continue a, a progression forward. Totally. Um, another question asked in the Q&A, um, any advice on how to get the brain sailing started? Um, we tried last month via a whole team Zoom and the team was largely very quiet. Oh yeah. Okay. This is, um, yeah, gosh, I wish I had our um, facilitator, our designer on for the <laughs> team bonding so we facilitate because she thinks about this all the time. Yeah. Um, so the hierarchy thing is a big thing, right? So a lot of times when, if you're in a brain sale environment, but you haven't actually flattened that hierarchy, then people are going to fear brain sailing because it it's, you're saying one thing, you're saying that it's a moment for everyone to um, offer, you know, sort of without judgment, their ideas, but most of our culture, our team cultures and work environments are set up to where there's a hierarchy that's judging <laughs> the validity or the, um, the, you know, ability to move forward on some of those ideas, right? So one thing is to really think about um, flattening that and removing that. And I'm trying to think of like some ways to do that. So um, one is maybe, you know, to make it a consistent thing. So it's not tied to a specific um, like objective or milestone that you're trying to reach or a goal. So just to make it sort of like, you could um, just make it regular or consistent based on like an interval, like at once a quarter or something, we sit down, we talk about everything, then it's not tied to an outcome. Um, think you could hire an external facilitator. I do think that sometimes to get even if you're not hiring them, right? Just ask a friend or ask somebody else if they'd be present in the in the session to facilitate that. Because I think sometimes that person doesn't have all the um, the same like frameworks about how people show up and how they typically show up, how they typically do things, how they typically contribute. They're not going to have those preconceived notions about your team, and so they're going to be able to come in in a much more sort of democratic light and kind of see everyone as a similar contributor. So I think that getting someone in who has a, is not um, grounded in your team can be really helpful for that as well. And those are just a couple tactics that we used. Um, the external facilitation really does invite everyone to participate. Mm -hmm. We obviously are always about um, throwing in something fun that is not like the actual work itself. But sometimes that can be seen as really, um, I think when that's done without intention, it comes across as not authentic and sort of like yeah. people get really like, eh, why are we doing this? So, I mean, you know, your team and you know, your um, people, but I think one of the big, another big mistake that I'm thinking that people make a lot is they, um, okay. So how like uh, they'll offer, they'll say, Hey, this is a brain, a brain sale session. Right. But then as part of that, you'll work in something tactical that actually has to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. So this is happening a lot, right. Or we see it a lot, even when we were in the team bonding space is that people would say it's a holiday party, but as part of the holiday party, I also want to talk about our strategy for next year and also reflect on last year's strategy and accomplishments. And you're like, well, those are two sort of different things, right? Different so kind of party. <laughs> So just keeping it what it is and being really authentic and like honest about what that is and then letting it just be that. And that's okay. So strategy session, you know, holiday party, those two can, those two things can both exist and they're both great. <laughs> so. Yes. Um, another question that came in, um, how do I improve morale on a team when I know some of the staff are dissatisfied with some broader organizational changes. Yeah, it's a great question. I was talking to an HR leader yesterday who had a very interesting take on this. Um, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't heard it 
put this way. And I, I, I think it's interesting, right? So I think what she was saying is they do a lot of survey surveying of their team. Um, and there are moments when you are face to face with morale declining and you need to evaluate whether that sort of, um, makes sense, right? Like if you've, if you put in a lot of change, people typically don't love a lot of change. So it would stand to reason that there would be some low morale associated with that, right? So it's sort of like, you can look at the data and you tie it to what's actually happening. So if you're saying that you've put in a lot of, you know, things have been changing, that makes sense that your team would feel a little bit sort of like, whoa, I don't like that, right? And you can reasonably expect that for some period of time, those feelings would sort of be there, right? I think being obviously open and transparent about why you made the changes, being as um, you know op open and transparent as you can about that is really helpful to people. I think when you don't share things with people, they tend to make up their own um, ideas or have their own, you know, they'll talk and kind of come up with their own reasons as to why those changes may have happened. So I think addressing things up front and state and being um, just being up front and what's the word, like um, getting ahead of it. Um, but I do think that morale is something that it's not going to decline overnight and it's not going to get better overnight. These are a, lo a lot of what we talked about today are sort of long-term intentional day by day. It adds up over time. And so I think that it is like, it's okay for your team to go through times when things don't feel great. If you have a vision for how you're bringing them through that, that's super helpful, right? So it's not the worst thing to have bad morale. It's, it's right. bad when it sticks around for a long time and you're not, it's sort of not moving yeah. to a healthier place. <laughs> yeah, that's authentic for things to have mm -hmm. and post. Yeah, and yeah. Makes a ton of sense. Mm -hmm. Um Another question, when it comes to virtual meetings, how can we break the habit of staying mute or camera off and boost oh, yeah. engagement? Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, we used to put a stipulation in our team bonding events, right? That we were expecting folks to come in with cameras on, uh, the mute function off. Um, so one, you can just say it. <laughs> you can just start asking for it. It is really, um, we find, because we've worked with a lot of teams where that was the culture, um, and it takes time, like anything else to change a practice and a, and a habit, right? So it's probably not going to be really comfortable for the first time that you're asking folks to do it. You should say why that's important to you. Um, and you should be honest with yourself as to like, does it really matter? And if it does really matter to you, like it really mattered for us in our events that people showed up that way, our events weren't as effective when people were not on camera and were mute. Um, and we would say that in our introduction, we would explain to people why we were inviting them to participate, inviting them to participate in that way. And I think that you want to make sure that you are very honest with yourself, why you want your team to show up that way, to communicate that, and then just to ask for it. And it'll take a little bit of time and it won't be great all the time, but it'll start to happen. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, what advice do you have for collaborating with difficult team members without impacting culture? That is a great question. Okay. So first of all, I want to say one thing about the role model. So the, the one other thing there on the last question is when you ask people to do that, you cannot then show up on mute and with your camera off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's another thing that sort of like is about mm -hmm. this whole thing, right? If you're asking folks to do it, it needs to happen for you too. So you can ask yourself one of the times when I would rather be off camera and I'd rather be on mute. Like there are times that you probably feel like that too. So just being honest about when you can allow people to make that call for themselves and right. you know when that's not, that maybe there's certain types of meetings where that's not an option. There are certain meetings where there are, that is an option just so people get that break in the same way that you might want that break yep. is modeling the behavior. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, so a couple thoughts on that last question. I mean, I do think that there um, are challenging conversations in relationships that are coachable and there are challenging conversations that maybe it's not that it's not coachable, but maybe in this moment in time, it's not the best use of your time as a founder or in a company to try to 
coach or change behavior in an individual employee that isn't open to that change or doesn't want coached in that way, or it's not the right fit, right? So you hear this a lot. And I think it's so true. Obviously it, it costs so much more to um, hire someone that's not a great fit than to spend the time up front. And that's what we are talking about a little bit in that interview and onboarding process to really find out if they're the right fit. But beyond that, I do think that um, establishing trust outside of the challenging behavior is really helpful, right? So if you can have check-ins that are again, removed from the moments that you're trying, that are challenging so that it's again, set to an interval or something that doesn't correspond to, oh, I'm really annoyed with you now. And now I have to talk to you about this in front of people or not. Um, and so that you're removing that and you're moving it into like a, a space that's separate from the event itself is super helpful. So a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, once a week, one, twice, once a month, once a quarter is really helpful. Um, and then I think that, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I typically don't coach people in, in a group setting on challenging, uh, things that I find challenging, right? I usually save those for moments that are in more one-on-one -on -one type sessions. Um, but there is somebody, my, our old GM used to say, your team is only as good or sort of maybe not good's the word is only as like positive as the worst sort of like negative, like the most negative person on your team, right? Your team will sort of like, um, it will be brought down or it will be like, it will sort of coalesce around that behavior. So if you're enabling and allowing um, challenging behavior to exist on your team, your whole team will be affected by it. And it will start to sour those relationships and their ability to do their work and all of that. So um, it does need to be addressed. I just don't know if I would address it necessarily in a, in a group setting, more in those one-on-ones. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then for our last question, before we wrap up, um, if there's one takeaway or tip for <laughs> our, our webinar attendees to leave with, what would you say it would be? That's um, tough. You said a lot. There's a oh, lot yeah, of kids that was, here. No, 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 that's okay. I always think about, so I find a lot of, and I saw this in our cohort too, with the fellow, the founders that I was with, I think there's mm -hmm. such a mentality in um, the startup space and the early stage space of just doing it yourself, right? And I think that part of that is tied to the financial reality of being at an early stage. People and talent cost money, right? Um, but I think if you can um, think about the fact that you are probably going to be, this is a long game. Any of us that are um, in entrepreneurship know that it is not um, it's not quick. It's not fast. There's not overnight success, right? So it's usually years and years and years in the making. Um, I think I get a lot of joy out of working with people. Like I cannot imagine having done the past decade of what we've done by myself, right? Um, so I think just questioning whether you will really be happier working with a team and working with people. Like I think a lot of people it gets lonely. So working with other people is really just more enjoyable. Um, and then that you will accomplish obviously so much more. It'll, it'll increase your run rate as a founder. If you can start to, um, you know, motivate and encourage other people to contribute to your company. And I think that, um, it, it's really hard when you get to the moment where you have to hire and you haven't really thought about some of those practices and things. So I really, I encourage people to look to a team earlier than maybe a lot of startup founders and entrepreneurs are used to making that first hire. Even if it's part-time, even if it's someone just to back you up a bit, to share a coffee with, to help you with something that's, you know, maybe a task that you're willing to get rid of. Um, it's just more fun. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, unfortunately, um, spend way too much time in it alone and doing it themselves versus trusting other people to help them out. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's tough, tough, <laughs> tough, tough thing to figure out. <laughs>
<laughs> it um, is very tough. Yeah, it's not easy for sure. <laughs> yeah, but I think I think valuable. And I think it kind of speaks to our community in a way, right? I think a lot of you all, when I interview you guys, you're like, mm -hmm. this is such a lonely journey. And so being able to be a part of community is also just totally. really helpful. And that team community, external community, um, I think everyone is looking for a connection. And I think that's really what you talked about today is how to make that connection and culture strong. So thank you, Malika. There was a lot of good yeah. things in here. Thank you so Absolutely. much.